freedom of the individual, alone or in concert, to pursue the potential re rewards of creating that technology and using it to develop space resources. We see an historical parallel with the European age of discovery that began in the 15th century. Dominant nations developed exploration technology to jockey for the geopolitical advantage. Entrepreneurs used investment capital to buy this technology, then used it to bring back a wealth of new resources to the old world. It was to, to develop these resources that business people coined the term share for the part of a venture organization that could be bought and sold. There are those, however, who would rather see science crippled, who would rather leave the water and mineral research resources of near Earth space sitting unused millions of miles away than have private profit-driven concerns make them available for human use. They believe it would be wrong for individuals to accomplish the tasks of opening space unfettered by the direction and control of those incapable themselves of accomplishing those tasks. These people do have the opportunity and the motive to erect bureaucratic obstacles to commercial development of space exploration technology, science be damned. We believe one task of space industrialists will be to educate both the, both the public and government officials about the importance of clearing the way for private ventures and the dangers of accommodating biased and unscientific thinking about the appropriateness of human activity in space. This education is part of ASR's strategy for boosting space exploration, and I'll come back to it more later. Though the Space Exploration Initiative languishes, scientists and engineers have continued to discuss the means by which lunar and Martian bases could be built using in situ materials. In experiments using various heating schemes to heat and reshape basalts into bricks and ceramics, Lockheed Martin found differences in results between MLS-1 a high titanium crystalline basalt whose content approximates Apollo 11 samples, and JSC-1, a glass-rich basaltic ash similar to Mare soils. There is a long history of industrial basalt casting in Europe, and such casting on the moon from ilmenite-enriched or iron-rich lunar basalt could produce oxygen as a byproduct. Could we learn more about how to make this work on the moon? if actual lunar samples were available to industrial R&D departments? Quite possibly. Interestingly enough, under other scenarios, extracting oxygen from lunar regolith could leave metallic byproducts, such as iron, aluminum, magnesium, and titanium, not to mention calcium used in cement-type building materials. Industrial glasses for construction and insulation purposes can be developed from lunar soil materials as well. Most lunar soil consists of minerals that can be used in building structures, and structures will be necessary for shielding from solar and cosmic radiation and temperature variations. A 50 meter by 50 meter patch of mature lunar soil, that is 80% agglutinates, a condition which is estimated to exist on about 57% of the near side, could yield 400 tons of fine particle soil for cement making, 1,700 tons of agglutinates for industrial glasses, and 17 tons of iron. For any given proposed base site, however, the geological implications must be identified. What resources specifically are available there, and what are their properties? Although the concept of concrete type building materials on the moon is problematic because of the water requirements, Experiments done on lunar simulant and actual lunar samples found cement from the lunar samples to be much stronger than the cement made from simulant. Clearly, the time will come when research and development will have to graduate from preliminary work on simulants to experimentation with actual lunar and Martian samples. Martian soil, too, holds promise for solar cell manufacture because of its salt and sulfate content. We do not yet know, however, how they are distributed in the soil. Salts with different distribution or origins will be distributed differently in the soil. Moreover, we do not yet know whether there are borates in Martian soil. We know, however, there are salts that can be used in making solar cells and also in general manufacturing. Fertilizer and glass could be produced from the silica and soda in calcium carbonate. Among the many open questions about Mars, which alone would take a conference paper, is whether there is water on Mars in the form of subsurface permafrost. While ASR is not currently planning a Martian sample mission, 
We have kicked this idea around once or twice and would certainly never shut the door to the possibility. ASR's goal is to use existing technologies to deliver spacecraft to any destination with precision and return resources and information with equal precision for a profit. We are working hard to make our lunar retriever mission profitable both to establish ourselves as a viable company and to demonstrate proof of concept for commercial space missions. Making this mission profitable will involve not only making affordable lunar samples available to individuals on the commercial market, but working in commercial tie-ins. Our current projected mission profile is as follows. On Monday, August 27, 2001, at 11 p.m. local time, or 400 hours Tuesday universal time, we intend to launch from Spaceport, Florida on Cape Canaveral, our proprietary lunar transfer vehicle, whose primary payload will be a sample return capsule and robotic machinery to load the capsule. It will also deploy video equipment that will transmit to Earth a live feed of the lunar retriever's activities on the moon's surface and its departure for Earth. We intend to land the spacecraft in Mare Nectaris at 400 hours universal time on Tuesday, September 4th, about 30 hours after local lunar sunrise. On Thursday, September 6th, at about 700 hours universal time, the lunar retriever's ascent stage engine will ignite and lift the sample return capsule into a trajectory for return to Earth. The descent stage will remain on the moon's surface and continue broadcasting live video and other telemetry to Earth for at least one lunar day, perhaps longer. Reentry should occur Tuesday, September 11th at 5 a.m. local time, or 1,200 hours universal time, at the Utah Test Range. It will bring us roughly 10 kilograms of lunar regolith from this previously unexplored region of the moon. But wait, there's more. <coughs> We're working not only on the engineering, but the financing of this mission. For business, we will offer advertising space on our hardware, as well as broadcast and webcast rights to mission footage, including the live video feed from the moon. For consumers, we intend to offer not only customary mission memorabilia, some of which you can pick up free here today, like this cool and groovy keychain which says, we're going back. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> but we will also offer several other means of touching the moon. We will, we will send up a lunar time capsule containing a nickel disk micro-inscribed with names, messages, and even images from people around the world. We will include up to five eight and a half by 11 pages reduced to grayscale images visible through a jeweler's loop and provide a duplicate disk to the purchaser for around an estimated $150. We will have a web server on the surface of the moon delivering moon pages containing even more names, images, and other information from space enthusiasts. And public use of the remotely controllable Lunar Thrill Cam, offering a live video feed via the internet. Many purchases will come with a certificate for a discount on an affordable lunar sample. Once our goal is achieved, we expect individuals will be able to purchase a piece of the moon for under $200 and possibly less. We have some disagreements on how we can do this. If we can lower the price, fine. But we'll have these at local stores that specialize in science and nature merchandise. We're already working on, um, we've been in some discussions on strategic partnerships regarding uh, collectibles and other such items. and. Um, Hopefully plans will be in place by the time we launch. With a successful mission, a number of things happen. We make money, and individuals get to own a piece of the moon. Researchers get new lunar samples at prices we're looking for ways to lower. I note that the Lunar Exploration Science Working Group at Brown University has identified in its planetary science strategy for the moon, samples from key impact formations, including the Nectaris Basin, has holding the key to major new knowledge, not only of both lunar geological history and the early bombardment history of Earth. And given the publicity surrounding the first successful commercial lunar mission, especially if we show a profit, other business people and entrepreneurs get a clue that they might do well to join us in developing space exploration technology. 
Unfortunately, we will need to clear some bureaucratic obstacles before we or anyone else can truly fulfill the promise for science, exploration, and resource prosperity that commercial activities in near-Earth space offer. Some of the bureaucratic obstacles to commercial space activities have to do with the relatively unformed state of the law regarding transport of materials back to Earth. Were ASR to land our lunar retriever today, we would have to land it where it could go through customs before we could touch it. <laughs> oh, please, not Los Angeles International Airport, please. You come from somewhere else, you must have an ulterior motive. Our dogs and we will determine it. <laughs> this would change with the passage of the Commercial Space Act, which has passed the House and gone to the Senate, I believe it's in the Finance Committee, and it's expected to get out once they finish dealing with the tobacco bill. In addition, the Commercial Space Act would direct NASA to purchase data and services from private firms where doing so would be less costly than executing the same activities in-house. This will include lunar samples, lunar data, and transportation of scientific packages and robotics to lunar orbit and the lunar surface. ESR's lunar transfer vehicle will be ideal for these services. International law is currently ambiguous on the topic of commercial space activities, and especially the physical ownership of space resources. In 1984, the United Nations did enter into force a 1979 agreement covering the activities of states on the moon and other celestial bodies, commonly known as the Moon Treaty. Part of this treaty interprets the moon and other interplanetary bodies as the common heritage of mankind and appears to prohibit the private ownership of planetary resources. This common heritage of mankind principle, or CHOMP, as we call it, <laughs> had been used in the earlier UN Law of the Sea Treaty. This was proposed by the Gang of 77, a group of non-industrialized third world countries that wish to have the revenues from undersea mining redistributed to countries not capable of such mining themselves. This language effectively killed the technologically feasible endeavor of undersea mining. Investors had no assurance any profits would remain after these outside parties took a hefty cut off the top. With the principle of appropriation established, they had no guarantee that their capital would, would be safe from outright confiscation. With the moon and cislunar space being under the jurisdiction of no recognized government that, that can claim actual physical jurisdiction <laughs> over the relevant territory. I'm sorry, I'm reminded of a uh, remark over dinner of some other cislunar space activities, which are generally considered to be un unsavory. Which will go unmentioned. Yeah. Which will go unmentioned. All right. <laughs> I'm wondering what was so funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, um, we get a lot of creativity from our team of cut-ups, but occasionally. <laughs> anyway, with, with, with no recognized government having any actual phys physical jurisdiction over any of this territory or space, it would probably be the practical equivalent of the high seas and might fall under the law of the sea treaty. We can only conjecture as to what this would mean. Most likely, nobody can own the moon, but everyone can go there, provided they fly the flag of a nation state. In theory, vessels traveling to the moon without a flag could be seized by any legitimate vessel as a pirate ship. The truth of the matter is that the laws are so ambigu ambiguous, we won't know what will happen until someone goes to the moon and brings something back. Fortunately, under President Reagan, the U.S. declined to ratify the moon treaty. It is our understanding that U.S. policy will allow us to mine and retrieve our samples, but not to own real estate on the moon. However, the Moon Treaty calls for an establishing an international regime to affect the same redistribution of revenues called for in the Law of the Sea. To date, such a regime has not been established. It is our understanding that the U.S. position is that the Moon Treaty places, and this is a quote from some State Department materials, no moratorium on the exploitation of the natural resource of the moon pending establishment of an international regime, unquote. <clears throat> because of the potential for frivolous lawsuits, it will be incumbent upon the companies looking to develop these resources to lobby and educate the policymakers who will want to have a say in our industry's activities. ASR, for one, intends to promote a very simple principle. Get rid of the red tape. <laughs> <laughs> 
and we will help open space to human use. One major obstacle to clearing the path to the riches of the solar system is the fact that too many people are framing this issue in terrestrial terms, specifically concepts about scarcity and potential downstream side effects of resource exploitation and extraction. These fears are irrelevant when it comes to space resources. Our solar system is huge and contains a large number of uninhabited bodies from which resources can be extracted without despoiling our experience of them. Unless one's idea is that they should be pristine points of light in the sky forever uncontaminated by the evils of human presence, activities, and especially human culture. And yet, the languages of terrestrial ecology and sociology are being used to promote restrictions on space exploration. For example, a British journal essay urged space explorers to treat other bodies like threatened wilderness lands on Earth, proposing that we take only photographs, leave only footprints. A post to a Usenet news group called for banning materials handling activities on the moon on the ground that such work would disturb the lunar atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, they're like making the lunar atmosphere like all gnarly. <laughs> One of the most significant steps in human evolution, our moving beyond our home planet into space, is being characterized as another case of humans destroying the natural realm through our very presence. This notion is especially abs absurd when applied to asteroid mining. Given that asteroids are nondescript big rocks or ice cubes millions of miles away, now, it's one thing when the usual anti-science, anti-rational suspects stereotype as dangerous and in need of controlling those daring to achieve great things for space exploration and science. Unfortunately, some of the most serious damage to private space exploration could unwittingly be inflicted upon it by people among the most enthusiastic about increased access to space. What makes anyone believe that people with the qualities it will take to open space to the individual are untrustworthy and must be overseen by bureaucrats. Do they fear losing access to the benefits of space resources? They will never realize those benefits without individual enterprise. Or do they fear space development will be stifled by governments unless they sell out everyone's freedom to explore space? Unless they impose preemptive restrictive schemes on consenting and non-consenting space explorers alike? Whatever the motive, those who would have the earthbound govern the activities of the spacefaring agree with the superstitious on a common concept. Development activities in space must be subject to a tyranny of the majority. As Americans, ASR's founders believe in principles of self-government that were a response to an earlier attempt to impose confiscatory law from abroad on a frontier economy. We hold it self-evident that all people are endowed with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. At ASR, we are exercising our liberties in pursuing happiness by putting together our own lunar mission. We may attempt to explore more of the solar system after that. <coughs> Technology for which we are paying will go forth into vast, uninhabited reaches so far off that its activities will not be visible through the most powerful terrestrial telescopes. It will conduct its activities and collect materials where there are no species to endanger, no indigenous people and cultures to displace. It will return with things and information of great benefit to humankind. We will not consent to be told by other human beings, whether individually or in some collective grouping of the non-spacefaring, where in space we may go, what we may bring back, and whether or not we may keep the products of our hard work and creativity. No matter how supposedly representative of humanity any such body might be, it would still be a group of people deciding on their own to give themselves power over other people and their activities. And it would be a mistake. It would be a mistake for two reasons. First, History shows us that the best law for any frontier is law developed by those on the frontier. The pioneers have direct experience with the particular conditions of the frontier. They also have a personal stake in law that protects individuals, their property, and their endeavors from force and fraud, and provides a just mechanism for the resolution of disputes. 
<coughs> On the other hand, externally imposed regulatory regimes have a vested interest in turning pioneers into cash cows. We saw this in the events leading to the American Re Revolution. We saw this in the effects on ocean floor mineral resource recovery of the Sea Treaty. <coughs> we do not want to see this in space. We do not believe anyone can claim jurisdiction over bodies beyond Earth, much less over the people using those bodies in absentia, whether for themselves directly or on behalf of humanity in the abstract. Second, no planned scheme for developing space will ever be as productive or creative as the cumulative effect of the self-directed activities of free individuals. This is especially true where individual initiative is banned or cur curtailed to create a centrally planned monopoly these same individuals would be forced to finance through taxes. The tragedy of collectivist control over space development is that it would kill any hope of using space resources for humankind, and that in the name of guaranteeing access to those benefits. The solar system is too large, too vast, and too rich in resources for any individual entity to monopolize saved by force against individuals on Earth. Moreover, modern communications and information technology make it possible for consumers to both obtain and demand information <coughs> on the philosophies, ethics, and business practices of space enterprises. At ASR, we are building a corporate culture and an innovative work environment for the 21st century on a philosophy of freedom. We believe our philosophy, ethics, and business practices will be selling points for commercial space activities in general, and that we therefore have a self-interest in communicating them. The vote to which we would put our plans is the vote of the marketplace. Investors and consumers voting yes or no on our space enterprises with their investments and their purchases of services and products. Social theorist Friedrich Hayek in his 1974 Nobel Memorial Lecture entitled The Pretense of Knowledge warned, quote, against becoming an accomplice in men's fatal striving to control society, a striving which makes him not only a tyrant over his fellows, but which may well make him the destroyer of a civilization which no brain has designed, but which has grown from the free efforts of millions of individuals. ASR's founders are among the individuals who, whose free efforts will promote the space exploration goals of people at this conference. The freedom of, for individuals like us, or like or any, any of you who dare to venture into space, is what will make further progress in space exploration and science possible. Progress cannot be planned. It does indeed grow from the free efforts of individuals. I ask you to speak up for freedom and to encourage your elected representatives to clear the path for human creativity to expand our presence in and our knowledge and use of the solar system around us. We believe humankind will benefit from the resources of space only when they are developed by private enterprises such as ours. We intend to use our knowledge, creativity, hard work, and business vision to demonstrate the viability of market-driven space missions. We will not ask you to send us into space. We will go into space first, then come to you with something to offer the productive utilization of the vast resources of near Earth space. Thank you. Yes? What's your estimated mission cost and what's your return payload capacity? When we started, um, we decided to go ahead with, with this business on the on the calculations that we could do this for under 100 million dollars the cost is now down to under 60 million dollars and we anticipate bring, being able to bring back 10 kilograms roughly of lunar regolith and, and you're not expecting this to sell those 10 kilograms for 200 dollars you put it at no. One grain at a time. One grain at a time. <laughs> uh, the, the collectibles will in, be in small samples. Basically, we could seriously undercut the price of uh, lunar and Martian meteorites <clears throat> and, and still turn quite a handsome profit of, of at least 50% and possibly more. Um, this, just this past week, it was a, Jay, it was a um, Martian meteorite or lunar meteorite? Lunar meteorite. Lunar meteorite. Um, a nice chunk of one was uh, auctioned off at Sotheby's for the equivalent of $16,000 per gram. 
we have room to seriously undercut that and <coughs> still haul in masks. Our winter rocks will be fresh. Yes. I'm only 60 years old. And so are some of our principals. <laughs> Uh, yes. That asteroid 3554 Ammon that you mentioned, it mm -hmm. seems that if it were hollowed out, you know, more like a worm in an apple, if you mined it in that fashion, you'd have a handy habitat to, afterwards. That you could. So what, what we are promoting the idea is that we're one set of individuals, we're one business who are doing things, and, and if we're successful, hopefully, uh, other people will get backing to do that kind of thing. There are people, you know, talking about the habitat and like like yourself. That's a great idea. You could float in space. I hope they'll make windows. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The the what was it the sixteen thousand dollars a grand that you talked about uh, that was auctioned off? That that was just purely collectibles. Purely or was collectibles. It for scientific purposes. That one, I believe, went went to collectors. collectors. What we're trying to do is. Um, the type of collectibles that that would be made with, with our samples would have, you know, small amounts, visible amounts, and probably the collectibles would have magnifying devices to make them even even more visible. We're hoping to exploit the commercial market in order to bring the cost down down for science. And we've had some people say, "Hey, you ever thinking of going here? Ever thinking of going there?" And hopefully, when when we have enough uh, money that the Necessity for private for outside investors for future missions is brought down to a minimum. Then we can go ahead and do those science missions. Also, once we've done the first one, we've already uh, spent the development costs of of the lunar retriever and made them back. So subsequent missions will be less expensive. We're also going to look for lots of commercial tie-ins, such as selling the. Um, the broadcast and webcast rights for the footage from the moon to plastering logo, logos on about anything <coughs> anyone will give us mass quantities of, of money to to plaster them on. Jay and I are still arguing over who came up with the idea first. Um, we don't know if Spielberg or Warner's has the rights to this now, but we'd love to see someone give us millions of dollars to plaster Acme Moon Rocket on the side of our launcher. Will yes. it be Coke or Pepsi on the moon? <laughs> <laughs> um, we haven't ever. started the bidding war yet. Whoever pays us more money. <laughs> yes, in the back. Have you heard anything about Lunar Economic Development Authority? Uh, yes, I have. You're looking to do a bond issue to? Yes. That's the United Societies in Space is the parent organization. Mm -hmm. That's going into effect here in the, within the next 30 days. You're, you're, you're floating the bond issue, or? Yeah. Cool. Do you have backing for the bonds, or uh, are you doing it pri as private? Uh... It'll be private, but uh, uh, you know, it's an immediate return, all by a small, but uh, with the chance after some of these projects get funded that uh, any profits that are reaped out of that, that that will be shared, shared in, but that should, it's, the first initial is really exciting. The interest in it and corporations and everything else are, are already asking about them. Mm -hmm. So that should take off right away and be able to fund the, quite a few projects that are going on right now. Mm -hmm. We're looking at... Uh, Those handouts you have there. Yes, these are handouts. Probably copies of, of this Brilliant paper, if I do say so myself, <laughs> and I do repeatedly. But copies of the first issue of our Inner Resources newsletter, which uh, we distribute electronically and printed up some some copies for those who haven't yet signed up. We have a website www.appliedspace.com. We have an email list to which we'll send periodic uh, new issues of Inner Resources. We have these. Cool and groovy keychains. <laughs> Say we're going back because we are. Uh, the financing of it, we're looking at a couple rounds of, of financing <coughs> for a couple different stages of, of mission operations, and we'll probably do uh, an initial an initial public offering of common stock close to the launch itself. 
We've been uh, moving forward on all fronts. Mission design, which uh, is Jay's province. The business end of it, we've had discussions with uh, potential strategic partners and are cranking on the business plan to take, take to Wall Street where she's worked for a number of years. And uh, you have myself who writes stuff and comes to conferences like this and runs off at the mouth about what we're doing. It's good to have a job like that. <laughs> uh, it's a dirty job that somebody's got to do. It's a dirty job that somebody's <laughs> got to do it. <laughs> Being opinionated is one of the things I do very well, fortunately. Some more questions? Okay, well I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd like to uh, appreciate uh, Verona Home Access Television taping this. And if I may, in the best traditions of, of local ac access television, party on, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> party on, Jay. <Beth. laughs> thank you very much.